Good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this morning's session. I'm John Messenger here from the University of Colorado, um, here with Alan Jeremias. Uh, we've got a great panel today. Um, Sheila Sani is right here to my left. Uh, Dr. Jaffer, Farouk, how are you? Good to see you. Michael, how are you? And, um, sorry, Yasser Chu, good to see you. So we're gonna start off our session today uh, with uh, Mazen Abu Fadel from Oklahoma talking about femoral access complications. Mazen, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you again for the organizers, Manas, for inviting me again. <coughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, femoral access complications, mainly related to, of course, coronary, uh, not large bore, uh, and not due to that. No conflict of interest related to this talk. As you guys know, femoral access complications really depends on what you read, what year the study was published, and how they define complications. You'll see a different range, around 1% for diagnostic, you know, 2 to 4% for interventional. And as large as 10%, and partners one trial as, large, as big as 25% complications on the access side. Uh, Looking at this uh, study here, this is mainly was for people who are getting peripheral interventions, but I think they still are very related to what we do in the coronary world. You can see the predictors of access site complications, mainly older age, female gender, um, if patient is not very mobile, bedridden before procedures, urgent procedures, all these that, that we know about. And the good, the interesting thing in this study was, you know, when people get access site complications, and this study mainly concentrated on hematomas and pseudoaneurysm, the worse the access site complication, the worst outcome, people get discharged to homeless, they go, have to go to a nursing home or skilled facility, and they're not as good after the procedure. And when you look at the 30-day mortality, all cause, and when you also look at the one year, you can see people with major access site complications actually don't do so well. So how to best treat complications is to prevent them from happening. So obviously all of us need to be aware of what we're dealing with. I think it's very important to select your patients. Not everybody needs to be femoral. These days, I, I, probably five to 10% of my cases are femoral if you have to. You have to be trained both radial and people who are doing 100% radial maybe need to maybe do sometime a little bit more femoral to keep that, you know, that ability to perform good femoral access and understand the anatomy and use what's been proven to be helpful. You know, we have a lot of studies on how to get good femoral access, so make sure you are aware of these and can use them. The list is long. This is not all the list, but you guys know the list. Uh, mainly hematoma, pseudoaneurysms would be the most common, but everything else on this list um, is bad, especially retroperitoneal bleeds. So I'm not gonna spend any time talking to you how to get access, but really use both fluoroscopy and ultrasound, like 100% of the time. And when you do that, you know, take a, also when you use a micropuncture needle, and when you do use the micropuncture needle, I like to look at the junction of the needle, where it entered the artery, uh, and that transition between the needle tip and the wire. And then when you look at that, you know if you are at the middle of the head of the femur where you can compress if needed, and then take a femoral angiogram, and we'll talk a little bit about the femoral angiogram before you give anticoagulation. So these are some angiograms here. So it's important to look at the angiogram, not just at the access site, if I can do closure or not. This is an old angiogram, you can tell from the picture. This is when we were still using the 18-gauge needle, multiple sticks, I'm gonna blame the fellow for that. Um, but you can see these small arteries next to the femoral artery that when they miss the femoral artery, hit that artery, they are bleeding pretty bad. And this can cause hematomas and all kind of stuff. So if you anticoagulate this patient, before you take an angiogram, this is only gonna get worse and you're gonna see it build up in front of you in the cath lab. Also, I like this picture a lot or this video because this is pretty interesting. The sheath went sub then went in the artery again. So if you don't take a femoral angiogram and you think, okay, do the procedure and then you wanna do angioseal or per close or whatever closure device you use at the end, this may be a lot of problems. So don't only look, the level of the axis is perfect, but then the, the axis itself is not great, the sheath side. And this is one thing why I always tell everybody I work with, when you take a femoral angiogram, please make sure there's a wire there in the sheath because if you don't have a wire, many times these iliacs are not straight 
and the tip of the sheath may be just against the iliac artery. Going up with equipments and wires can dissect, like you can see here, or even when you take a big angiogram and you're not connected to a pressure, you know, just inject manually, you can dissect. So I always like to take femoral angiogram with the wire up there to kind of protect you from things like that. Uh, other complications, this is a patient who had an angioseal. After the angioseal developed a cold foot, angioseal had unfortunately partially deployed in the femoral artery. We were able to go down angiojet a lot and do a lot of balloon angioplasty and kept him on anticoagulation. Thankfully, we didn't have to have surgery. You can see there's some residual there, of course, after what we did. Decided not to stent it because it's the femoral artery and to watch, and he did good on anticoagulation. But not all people do great. This is another case. A friend of mine sent me this picture. A patient had to go to surgery from angioseal, deployed wrong, and you can see the surgeon had to remove all this clot from his femoral artery. Well, talk about angioseal, you have to talk about perclose. So this is a carotid that I did, and after the procedure, everything went great. Perclose the carotid, uh, perclose the, hopefully not the carotid, perclose the femoral, but it was a perfect perclose where it sealed off the whole artery. So. With a lot of difficulty, we were able to wire this with an 014 wire. We were able to pass a balloon and had the surgeons on standby. This was, when this happened, it was the first one time I see it. And I didn't know if I would rupture that perclose, if I would rupture and lacerate the whole artery. But thankfully, that did not happen. At 5-0 balloon, the perclose ruptured, and, and the results were OK. We didn't have to do anything else for the patient. Pseudoaneurysms, you guys have seen them. This is not femoral artery, but this is popliteal artery axis. And same thing, but this was covered with a covered stent and looked nice. Of course, they can happen in low sticks in the femoral artery. Uh, and this is the same one. This had a very big uh, neck, so we could not seal it with thrombin or with uh, ultrasound, which would be the best way to do that. Had to have also a, a, a covered stent. So the diagnosis is usually with ultrasound. You see this biphase, bilateral flow in and out. You try to inject thrombin or hold pressure for 30 minutes, see if it resolves, if the neck is good. You can do thrombin injection. And some people where they fail conservative management or have issues with their arteries, their nerves, or you know, very high iliac pseudoaneurysm may need to go to surgery. AV, AV fistulas are also a problem, so you always uh, you know, try to make sure there's no thrill or brief before you get access there, especially if there's a history of something like that. And probably the thing we worry about most is the, are these high sticks. Ideally, you want the axis site to be below the most inferior margin of the inferior epigastric artery, uh, because this inferior epigastric artery loops around the inguinal ligament. So anything above this, you're theoretically above the inguinal ligament. So this is, this is very worrisome. When I see this, I usually like get radial axis or some kind of axis, and I try to perclose and not angiocene, and I'll tell you what. And then I really take an angiogram in the cath lab before the patient leaves to make sure they're not bleeding especially if you have a large sheet there, um, because this can cause retroperitoneal bleed. And sometimes if this starts happening in the cath lab while you're working, you can have this bladder sign where the bladder will be pushed, and instead of the contrast being in the whole bladder, it will be like as if it's in the half of the bladder. And that's a retroperitoneal sign that can happen. The reason why angioseal is not preferred in these high sticks, because some people claim that the collagen plug may get stuck on some of the muscles of the abdominal wall and not give you a good seal, and even though the angioseal may be deployed appropriately, it may still leak um, uh, from above the foot plate because it doesn't have that good compression. So uh, if, if you want to do perclose, that would be probably the best. Uh, so thank you for the time, and thank you again for being here. Thank you, that was a great overview. Um, you know, it's always scary to see all the stuff that we can cause, so if I ask the, 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 the audience now how many do radials, everybody is raising their hand, of course, never have a complication with that. But maybe I ask the panel about um, your split between radial and, and femoral and how dogmatic you are about the radial artery. Um, so maybe I can start. Um, I think for STEMIs, uh, we, we do go radial first and do the best we can. Um, when we're dealing with complex PCIs, brain graft interventions, um, I think there's a low threshold to use best practices and, and get safe femoral access. That, that's sort of our practice. Sure, happy to comment. Um, I think when it, we do a lot of um, CTO work, and so we typically are going to have one femoral-based access, some are biradial. 
So it is something I totally agree. There's just really great comments about um, being so multimodal with ultrasound fluoroscopy and kind of step-by-step -step checking each position of the needle before entry. Um, I think we're probably in the lab for non-CTO PCI, probably about 85% radial and 15% um, femoral for some of the more complicated ones. Great, I'm gonna echo that. Last year, I was uh, mostly doing CTOs, and there's definitely one, if not two, femorals. But before that, and from going on, I think the standard should be radial. And uh, for the more complex cases, is safe femoral, and being paranoid about closure, and uh, making sure that there's no complication. I'm a pretty uh, high, you know, I, I would say I do about 85 to 90% of cases radial when I can using ultrasound guidance just to promote patency, especially if I'm going to take it off the table and do it somewhere else, which I have to do with my practice. But ultrasound guidance is key, but you have to be prepared that you might not have access to ultrasound at all different hospitals. And that's where knowing the fluoro fluoroscopic technique is really important, but you have to be trained in femoral because it's your radial bailout. And then obviously obviously larger French sizes and large bore access. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think, you know, no matter where you go, you try to do it safely. You know, maybe my, I'm, I'm biased a little bit. In, in our center, I would say we, we do the majority femoral. Um, we do the straightforward stuff, radial. You know, everything complex, we do femoral. I do believe that you get better results, in all honesty. I think there is a certain level of hysteria in this country um, about going radial, maybe because we're behind the Canadian European colleagues who mostly are um, radial. I think in the US it's about 50-50. But I, at the end of the day, you know, we're there for a job, and the job is to fix the coronary, and we want to do that as, as, you know, as, as well as we can. And, um, you know, to be kind of so dogmatic about the access site versus actually getting a good result in the coronary seems to me a little paradoxical. So I feel like you have to do what's right with the patient at the end and of the unless day. Unless you get a good result in the coronary, then you have a big complication in the femoral, then all your work went to waste. Exactly. Right, uh, for sure. I think, I, think, I think getting good training and I think you can get good results with both, to be honest with you. Uh, I know some people prefer to go all femoral for all, everybody, for example, that has bypass and stuff. I've, I've yet had to do that, even to shoot all the limas. I mean, there are some techniques, very nicely described techniques. You go, you know, lima catheter, glide wire up the subclavian, you advance, you selectively select the limas and everything. So I think femoral is very important, but, um, but the complications are just so bad is the problem. I mean, that, that's really the biggest problem. But uh, I mean, how common are they in honesty? I mean, if you're in a teaching institution, I, I, I understand if, if you know, if you're experienced and you use best practices, ultrasound, you know, micropuncture, I honestly think that the, the complication rate is very, very small. Yeah. All right. Terrific. Thank, Thank you, you Manas. Appreciate it. Manas, you had a comment or? No, no, I'm just having this for any comments in the, in the, in the audience, you know, just uh, raise up your hand. We'll come around and give you the microphone. So. All right, let's move to the um, second session because don't believe that radial has no complications. So I'm really excited to hear about that. And we welcome uh, Lou Cole. Hello all, I'm Lou Cole from Minneapolis, Minnesota at Hennepin Healthcare. And I am gonna talk about radial axis complications. I couldn't agree more about the conception that we all need to be facile with both radial and femoral axis. Um, so here we go. So background, why are we talking about this? Radial axis has shown reductions in MACE bleeding and access site complications, and that's led us to adopt a radial first strategy. This is acknowledged by the recent revascularization guidelines. But I think we do have to acknowledge that there are radial access complications. We have to acknowledge that to consent our patients, and we need to know what to do with them when they occur. So how do you discuss radial access complications during consent? To put this out there as a question to think about, I'll tell you what I say. I say your rate of any complication is one or two percent, but the big bad stuff is much more rare. That is partially true. <laughs> Um, I think in reality, radial access complications are not vanishingly rare, even though we conceptualize them to be. Um, in Dr. Sandoval, Bell, and Gulati 
had a very nice review article on this topic a couple of years ago, which I will highlight on the next screen. But these are some of the, the radial axis complication rates that have been described in major radial trials. They are not vanishingly rare. They may not be as severe as a retroperitoneal hematoma, but they, they do occur. Um, but when you take all of these things together, including minor complications like re-bleeding or hematomas, the rate can approach 10%. But it's important to acknowledge, why are we doing radial access? The number needed to treat to prevent a major bleeding event as compared to femoral access is 47, and the number needed to treat to prevent a vascular complication is 21. So here's that lovely review article. I'm going to lean heavily on Yadder and colleagues here in kind of schematizing how to think about radial axis complications. They put together this lovely flowchart dividing complications into intra or post procedural and bleeding or non bleeding. I actually added a few to their schema hand ischemia, which uh, was not discussed there, and then axis site bleeding, which is probably one of the most common ones, um, but not included in their flow diagram. So let's see if I can make this work. Oh, there's a nice, from the left panel, we have spasm. We've all seen it in the lab. On the right panel, after some vasodilators, we take a soft, straight tip woolly wire, and we fly on by, and we're off to the races. So spasm, quite common, occurs about 15 and up to 15% of cases. Most times, it's rare. In the RAS registry, more than one puncture attempt in larger vascular sheaths were predictors of moderate to severe spasm. In these high volume transradial access centers, moderate or severe spasm occurred in 2.7%, and they were able to avoid crossover in 99% of cases. So how do we treat it? From my perspective, spasm is 100% avoidance, starting with meticulous technique, sure patients are well sedated, use friendly initial catheters without sharp curves, and use the smallest caliber sheath and catheter that is appropriate for the situation. Only use hydrophilic sheaths. And if your patient is discussing or reporting pain when you put in the glide sheath, stop. Give more sedation. And then most importantly, wait long enough for the sedation to work. I think too often we're impatient, we give sedation, and then we just fly forward, and then we haven't done anything. A vasodilator is exceptionally important. This is one of our best practices for apamil with or without nitroglycerin. And then, as was discussed earlier, the Rouse trial suggested that ultrasound-guided radial access is also helpful. I use it when I need more than one attempt, if I don't get it on the first pass, or if the pulse is weak. So what about during the procedure? If you encounter resistance to passing your J-wire, take an angiogram with the blue contrast, understand what you're dealing with so that you can differentiate spasm from aberrant anatomy. If spasm develops during the procedure, slow down. I mean, this is one of the most common things we deal with with our fellows. They're trying to go so fast and catheters are spinning like a helicopter. The patient discusses arm pain. We always need to slow down. And in the most severe cases, Yadder and colleagues put together this nice escalation strategy um, when you have an entrapped catheter or a sheath that won't move. It starts with augmenting sedation, heat, blood pressure cuff to high pressure on the upper arm for flow mediated vasodilation. And then, if needed as a last resort, we would consider either a regional nerve block or more commonly, just general anesthesia. Oop. Oh, hit the wrong button. I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, perforation. So this is another intraprocedural complication, a bleeding intraprocedural complication. I, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. This is quite rare, but anytime you have abrupt onset of severe arm pain on advancing a device, a wire, especially if there's swelling or fullness in the forearm, you should stop and think about this immediately. I really do enjoy the um, schema of is there a wire across or not. I think that is very important. 
if you have a wire across the perforated radial artery segment and the patient is doing okay, usually you can proceed. Your, your sheath, sometimes a longer sheath, or your catheter will typically tamponade the perforation by the time you're done with the procedure. But I think we need to keep patient safety in mind. And for non-emergent procedures, if you don't have a wire across and are not able to easily do so, you should stop, address the issue at hand, and then move along. And then I'm gonna quickly talk about hand ischemia. It is quite rare, but I may be overzealous in my radial access application and use it in a wide variety of patients, including those with end-stage renal disease. And I've run into several episodes of true, true hand ischemia with radial artery access, even though our guidelines would suggest that it is not possible. There is adequate collateral circulation through the pulmonary arch to get blood there. It just isn't the case sometimes. And this is a gentleman, a young 53-year-old gentleman who's having an angiogram, has circ disease, has angina, and abnormal stress test. We did this angiogram in the midst of the procedure. He discussed severe hand pain. So we took an angiogram, and you can see the just train track calcification of his ulnar artery. And then when we did a more focused angiogram of his wrist, there's severe ulnar disease in addition to that severe calcification. We took out the sheath, switched over to femoral access. His pain resolved almost instantaneously. We have about one or two of these a year. Aberrant anatomy is something I think it's less of a complication, but something we need to deal with. Also not rare, occurs in 14% of patients. Um, probably the most pertinent in that it leads to access site failure most frequently is a full radial loop. Um, in this study by Lowe and colleagues, radial loop, a true radial loop led to access failure or need for crossover in about a third of cases. I do think we run into it. This is where doing an angiogram is helpful. Got some spasm too, just to spice things up. I think in this case, we're able to use a traverse wire, a coronary wire. Eventually, we got around that loop. It's gonna happen, I promise. Boop, boop. Used a four French angled glide cath. And then, I think once you've gotten a catheter across the lesion, we can frequently use this technique of a counterclockwise torque in the right arm, a clockwise torque in the left arm, to unloop, and frequently continue on with your case. So, let's move to post-procedural complications. The most significant is bleeding. We've all had it. You get a call from the floor or the post-procedure area. Doctor, your patient's bleeding. Occurs up to 8% of in up to 8% of patients in the, in the CRASOC series of one, two, three trials. Um, I really think that minimization of post-operative, post-procedural bleeding is, is the essence of a multidisciplinary effort. Um, you need to use standard orders, and you need to provide regular education to the, to the staff who are helping take care of your post-procedure patients. We're, we're usually not the ones who are deflating the TR band. I think all Units in the hospital that accept post-catheterization patients need to have a manual blood pressure cuff so that you can control bleeding when, it's, when it occurs. And then in our lab, we found that having super users, usually some of our excellent x-ray techs or nurses to go address bleeding complications when they occur has been very helpful because you or your fellow are not always immediately available when you're in a procedure. Hematoma is sort of an extension of the bleeding um, issue as a post-procedural complication. You've got to recognize it. You've got to have folks who know what to do with it. Um, I would note that assessing your TR device should happen by someone who knows what they're doing. We've had lots of instances where we have a TR band on, there's a hematoma, someone well-meaningly adds air to it, and when we're able to go look at it, we find that it has migrated distally and we're just occluding arterial outflow and enhancing our hematoma, so to speak. 
the easy hematoma classification is excellent. The five there, extending beyond the elbow, is vanishingly rare, less than five in 10,000. Those are cases that very rarely require vascular intervention. Pseudoaneurysm, this is a case of mine. This was a, a 90 year old woman who had a PCI via right radial access, had a small post op hematoma, came to clinic and said, Doc, I've got this big thing on my arm. And sure enough, it was a pseudoaneurysm that we treated successfully with thrombin injection and ultrasound guided compression. They do occur. This is the only one I've ever had, but I think it's important to highlight that these can occur too. And then radial area occlusion. I, this is a whole topic unto itself. Um, the incidence has been reported from 1 to 33 percent. It's almost always asymptomatic, so what do we, why do we care? Um, I think the important part about radial area occlusion is in, it is in our hands using meticulous technique to prevent it from occurring. The PROFIT-2 trial was sort of the, the standard in this in that they used dual wall puncture, five French sheaths, vasodilators and heparin, ulnar compression during their patent hemostasis, and reported an a uh, radial artery occlusion rate of less than 1% at 30 days. I would also commend people to this excellent review article talking about the entirety of our experience with radial artery occlusion. And although it's asymptomatic, I think it's really important to preserve radial arteries because we need to get back in them sometimes to do more caths. And sometimes they get used for bypasses and other, other procedures. Those are my take home messages. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Dr. Cole. We've got uh, one minute for comments. Um, approaches to managing, you know, uh, perforation or dissection in the radials. Do you guys have any take homes or feedback on that? I just want, you know, it's a beautiful presentation, but in defense of radial, we have to respect that it is not like a femoral artery access. You have to be very delicate in handling those wires, knowing who your second operator is, if it's a tech, stopping when there's resistance is key. But being very meticulous about sedation, a lot of times those perforations or even pain from the radial loop, if you can treat them early on in the procedure, they're actually not going to cause you. You're going to get a lot of tamponade from the guide catheter. But you don't want the first time that you're doing a radial access to be the STEMI, right? So we have to be facile in doing them in our day-to-day -day procedures to avoid complications. Just to add one, one other um, comment, wondered if you had used this technique, but a lot of times when we've seen six French spasm induced um, by the radial sheath, we've downsized to a five French and continued. And then actually there's this whole form of sheathless guys that are 6.5 French that are the size of a five French radial sheath. That saved us from a few cases of crossover. Yeah, I, I agree completely. We've, I've moved almost exclusively to five French access and doing a good portion, maybe a quarter to a third of my piece, my straightforward PCIs with five French guides. And I think what you describe using smaller catheters, whether it's five French if you're with a six or a four French, if you start with a five, can really alleviate the spasm and let that kind of bad pain cycle break. And you can even get back to using six French catheters later in the case once the patient's become comfortable and their arteries have relaxed. Great. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. It's great. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Ziad Ali, uh, comment, or presenting on imaging coronary complications. I think we have a substitute, oh, right? Sorry. I'm sorry about that. I, um, I was just thinking of uh, having a comment. Uh, regarding radial or femoral axis, actually. Sometimes the flow of the center itself is de determining which approach you are going to use. For example, in the National Heart Institute in Egypt, where we do it, usually we do around 60 to 70 PCI per day, which is a very high rate, actually. And um, the staff like the nursing and technicians, they are rushing us, like as the physicians, actually to go with the femoral, because they are not going to need sedation. They are not going to need, like, you know, castor preparation, cocktail of heparin, and all this stuff. So sometimes the flow itself, or the flow of the patient to the center decides which way you are going to, to use. Actually, is it femoral or radial? Thank you so much. Great, thank you. So actually, Dr. Berlakis. 
giving the next talk after all. Oh, perfect. Yeah, sorry, I should have warned you. So what happened is there were some difficulties with flights and other things, so that's why um, I'll take off. So I'll just start showing you a case of complications. It's supposed to be about PCI complications, so all, all three of them, uh, vessel closure, perforation, losing stents, all in one case. These are my disclosures, and these are, again, the, the complications. And if you look at the purely coronary perforations, what can go wrong? Three things. One is you close the vessel. Second thing is you open a hole on the vessel. The third one is you lose things in the coronary or outside in the body. So it's actually a recent case. Um, it's a patient with previous uh, coronary bypass, which is a risk factor in itself. He um, did have uh, a occluded saphenous vein graft to the PDA. He did have significant angina. It was referred to us for opening the CTO of the right coronary artery. As you can see, it's a fairly long CTO. Um, and uh, it does have uh, a lot of complexity. It goes all the way to the PDA, all the way to the posterior lateral. And actually, um, what's happening here, this is actually a, the portion of the bypass graft going from the PDA and filling the posterior lateral. So obviously many, uh, many challenges there. And that's actually a case where triple injection, we're injecting from both um, uh, radials, so the bypass and the both native coronary arteries, so um, a lot of access points. So we were de debating before, yes, radial, femoral, but the reality is many times you need all of them uh, to get the case done. So how to go here? Not very good retrograde options. The plan was to go undergrade. Um, and then it was instant. We had a terrible time getting through um, heavy, I mean, um, heavy tip wires, the Carlino technique uh, didn't work out. Eventually, we had to knuckle around, so this is going outside the stand, which is not the optimal, but can work in select cases. And then uh, we're moving along the area of the vessel. We had a very hard time delivering a stingray. And then, uh, uh, as you can see here, we did an injection. Here is the vessel we're going afterwards. And um, um, what uh, we realized, maybe a little too late, is that we're actually not close to where the vessel is going. So this is not a good feeling. And um, we were able to pull it back, we redirected it, and then uh, we eventually got a stingray there with a lot of efforts, double blind stick and swap, pilot 200, as you can see now with true lumens, so this is good. But uh, we knew that um, it was going to be some challenge potentially, so we put the wire, we predilated, and uh, guess what? Uh, we now see a nice uh, perforation, so actually we were out. So it confirmed our initial suspicion. So what do you do? And I think it was discussed uh, the days, couple of days before, you have a perforation, what do you do? The first step is to put a balloon up to stop the bleeding, which was done. Now the level of complexity here is a little higher because in bypass patients, what can happen is you can have loculated hematomas that can be very hard to treat and may require emergency surgery or city-guided guidance. So the stakes are pretty high over here. So we put the balloon up, we do have an eight friends guide, this is an eight friends trap liner, so we have very strong support. Uh, we'll call for an echo, there's a small effusion, doesn't look too bad at this point. And then, well, we say, well, what's the solution for a large vessel perforation like this? Get the cover stem. So we get the PK papyrus down, and then the balloon comes up, the PK papyrus does not. Not the best time to have this happen, but fortunately, after quite some time and searching, actually it came out on the TUI. So this is how the PK papyrus looks after you take it out and uh, it's on the wire. Um, but how do we now get there? Because we still have the same problem and how are you going to seal the perforation? There are sometimes you get stressed out. This is one of them because the options here are not good. Going for emergency bypass doesn't often happen in bypass patients. It'll take the surgeon a few hours actually to get to the, where he needs to go. So the stakes are fairly high over this thing. So delivery is important. Got the second wire down. Um, couldn't get anything down, eventually got a second guide, so this is another eight friends, uh, the so-called ping-pong technique. One guide has the blocking balloon, the other guide is trying to deliver the uh, covered stand. Uh, we could not uh, get uh, the uh, papyrus stand, actually we lost two of them, uh, th but they both came out. So now the cath lab is running out of covered stands, that's why you should stock a lot of them. Um, we found out that uh, six friends guide extension is not big enough for delivering a cover stand, but PK papyrus, so there you go. And what gave the solution finally is after a lot of time and a lot of inch warming, we got a seven friends guide extension all the way to the posterior lateral, and we were finally able to get the cover stand in. And that was actually a big sigh of relief because again, the stakes were fairly high here and we didn't know what we we're going to do otherwise. So now we do have good flow there. We thought the last was going to be smooth, so we placed a bunch of stents. And um, 
uh, we take a picture, and now you see something lighting up on the distal RCA, um, right over here. And we thought, well, it must be the bypass graft. But the problem is the bypass graft is here. So what could that be? And again, that's a denial that happens often, and when you have a problem, look at another view. So guess what? We have another perforation. So that's the, I think it's called the Murphy's Law. And uh, here we go now, we have another um, large vessel perforation. The good news is by now we were able to get a guide extension now, so this time we didn't lose any PK papyrus. But this is, I think, the fifth uh, one that is going in there. So we're very happy at this point, like, what, can, what else can go wrong? Well, now the, pressure, the patient drops his pressure, now the pressure is down in the 80s. So of course the first thing that comes to mind is, oh my God, we have now a loculated diffusion, we're compressing a chamber, so us in the echo, get the ECMO standby. Uh, but interestingly enough, the echo actually was not changed, so not really much of an effusion. This is a little reassuring, but again, in bypass patients, you can never tell because it can be loculated and that's very hard to tell. So we eventually uh, took another picture and uh, actually the problem now is that the flow is very bad. And uh, what ended up happening, as we found out eventually, is that we did something to the skip graft that was supplying from the PLV to the PDA. So have, essentially we had a dissection of the, of the graft. And we did have quite some hard time, you can see it's a very tight lesion now at the PDA. Um, so I think what happened is with the wires going through, this got destabilized and now we had poor flow under grade. So after all this work. Now this is the one you don't want to be forceful because you have a dissection, if you start pushing hard, the next thing you know is you're going to make the dissection worse, completely slow the vessel, so close the vessel. So this is a SUO3 the 0 0.3 gram wire, the softest wire available, and it took a few minutes. This requires a lot of restraint for the operator to not push hard as the, is the natural inclination, but fortunately we were able to get it through. Delivering stents was a nightmare, but eventually we got the six French extension all the way down and were able to get uh, a stent across the distal anastomosis. And um, eventually that helped uh, to get this done, so at this point we're like, well, it should be done now, but look at the distal RCA. So we have a cover stand there, but it doesn't look as pretty as we would like it to, to do. So let's do a contralateral injection. And there's still some extravasation of contrast going out. And you can see it, it's not, it's less than before, but I mean, clearly, we do have um, more bleeding going outside on the distal RCA. We'll figure what, what the heck, you know, number seven papyrus, you know, we still had one, so. There you go, so that's actually, I think, the highest papyrus utilization uh, we had in our lab. I got a lot of phone calls for this. But the good news are, finally, the patient did well. Um, we were able to get everything through. He did not have an effusion. He was asymptomatic and went through. So the bottom line is complications is part of daily life, especially in complex lesions like CTOs. When it happens, it's good to know the algorithms. You saw the algorithms before for radial issues. There's an algorithm for everything, and you don't have to follow it verbatim, but knowing what to do is important. Thank you so much. Nice case. I'm sure your fellows were happy. It's a full day job to spend with this patient. Actually, it was. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things that, that we have noticed as well with the papyrus is that it's an amazing stent. It's slick. It, it goes places, but, but it, you lose it all the time. Right, and especially in the and there is a you know perf, um, you know you push, you do this, you do that, and, and next thing you know it's lost. So, our policy is actually to kind of deliver it um, always with a guideliner and then unsheath it. Okay. Any other stra strategies or that others have? Uh, Th thanks for sharing that. As always, Moss, that's, that's such an informative case, and I, it's really commendable. You also are very openly placing um, the contrast and radiation exposure, and that I think is really important to understand how complicated these cases are, and I know how much you um, focus on patient selection, but um, two comments. First, you forgot to thank the organizers for the invitation to talk, so I think you know that might be appropriate. <laughs> Second, um, in terms of um, the ringer balloon for this, what did you think about that? Like, if that were available for you on the shelf when you're having trouble delivering the papyrus, um, the ringer balloon, which is this going to be this new perfusion balloon. Um, what do you think about that? Would this be a nice case for that? Yeah, actually, that's a great point, and thanks for bringing it up. So the ringer, for people who don't know, the ringer is a balloon 
that is essentially has, um, it's like a perfusion balloon. So you inflate it and that uh, goes against the vessel wall so it can seal the perforation so you don't bleeding. But at the same time, you have flow through the middle of the balloon. So that would be a phenomenal one. I know there is a study that is going on. So hopefully in the next year or two, we'll have it available in the cath labs. But this would definitely be a great solution. The other thing is, the longer you have occlusion, the more likely you are to have hemostasis. So let's say we couldn't deliver the cover stand and the surgeons turned him down, which is probably the good. I mean, what is the option, right? I mean, you just essentially keep the balloon up for a long period of time and, uh, and you know, eventually things will seal. Now, I would not reverse, and I think that's a topic that we discuss all the time. I would not give protamine unless um, we have everything out. But if you have a cover, a, a, um, perfusion balloon like the ringer, that would be a huge um, advantage to this. I, I just wanted to add one thing. There was a, a very nice paper by Dr. Megali and, and Dr. Berlakis last year um, looking at outcomes with GraphMaster and um, PK Papyrus in the MOD database. And I think the summary from that was um, GraphMasters are harder to deliver, but they usually don't strip off your balloon, whereas uh, your PK Papyrus may be easier to deliver but oftentimes could be lost in the guide or even in guideliners. So just something to be, to be wary about. And actually, you know, Dave Kanjeri has the, um, I, the, the, the summary from PK Papyrus for the last few years, and it's actually very effective. It, it goes there most of the time. It's usually one stand uh, takes care of 75% or so of the perforation, so it does work, and it's a major improvement compared with GraphMaster. So actually many labs now have completely switched to uh, you know, PK Papyrus for doing their perforations. You were saying that it, you guys couldn't deliver it through the six French uh, guideliner, you have to upsize to a seven? Yeah, so it turns out that the ID of the six French is the same as the minimum ID of the Papyrus, but when you get it in, it's very hard, and what happens is if you get caught in the collar, you keep on pushing, the Papyrus may come off. Um, so again, we learned the hard way, fortunately we didn't lose it, but uh, the one way to do it is to preload it. So if you preload outside the body and then you advance it as a unit, then you can get it down. But then if you cannot deliver the guide, the guide extension without the inch warming, then that doesn't really do you much help. One question, boss, because I might have learned something new here. The SO3 choice for navigating dissections, is that your new wire to navigate if there is a dissection? Or? No, I, I think. You know, any soft wire will be fine. I mean, in this case, I think we had it on the table anyway from before, so we used it. But um, what you don't want is to get your, uh, you know, polymer jacket wire, like a filter or a pilot. You don't want to get your stiff wires like Gaius. What you want is something very soft and netromatic. Because the idea is if you go under and then you keep on pushing, you're going to worsen the dissection and lose the flow, and then it may be very hard or impossible to salvage it. Do you use workhorse wires for that as well? Yeah, so, so workhorse wire is the yeah. usual one. So typically yeah. when this happens, I will back off the guide a little bit if it's an osteal or back the microcatheter out a little bit so you don't really enter in the same spot. Leave, if you have a wire in the section plane, leave it there. And then go more proximal, try to get a different course from the course your wire had in the first place. Thank you. Great, All thank right, you. Manos, thank you so much. That was Thanks, an Manos. amazing case. And let's move on to the, uh, the next topic, which is um, TAVA-related coronary complications. And we have, I think, Mauricio here. Yes. Hey, how are you? Who has a lot of experience with TAVA, and I'm sure he has seen a complication or two in his days. Yeah. Well, you know, it's all my colleagues. Never mind. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here. So I'm, I'm going to present this case. It's kind of a vintage case. And uh, that's a way we all learn kind of the hard way. Um, so this is when we were <coughs> in, the, in the partner trial. This is a nested registry three, partner two, and we're going back more than 10 years uh, to 2012. So uh, the evaluation of patients in 2012 before placing uh, an Edwards valve was very different to, to current times. So this is a 91-year-old lady with severe aortic stenosis, prosthetic aortic stenosis. She had a Baxter valve, uh, 21 millimeters, creatinine's 1.6, um, her STS score is 10.3, 91 years old, nobody would think about doing a redo, uh, a, a redo AVR. So the way we used to assess patients those days was without a CT scan. Nobody would think about that these days. So that's a measure of the annulus, that's uh, the envelope showing 
that the uh, <coughs> gradient, the mean gradient is 43 millimeters of mercury, the Valberry is 0.66, and the Vmax is 456 uh, centimeters per second. So the patient had coronary disease, so we decided that um, at the time of the TAVR, we were going to treat the osteal uh, right coronary artery. So in those days, um, they wouldn't allow us to use uh, drag eluting stents. We had to use bare metal stents, so we treated this uh, fairly efficiently with a 3.5 by 12 millimeter um, bare metal stent. We had a good result, and the next step was to do, um, to do the TAVR. So this is uh, an Edwards, and a, this is a, an XT, uh, and this is uh, the placement of, uh, of the valve. At this time, we were working in the room with Bill O'Neill, and, um, uh, and this is the, the, the final result. So any comments about that? Would you just stop? The presentation is short, so we can we can discuss along the case. Yeah. So well, we yeah we thought it was okay, and <laughs> the right looks okay. We thought it was okay, so we took uh, there's no there's no AI, so we closed the groin. And we gave ourselves a, a pat in the back. I mean, another case. Then let's move on to the next uh, to the next case. Waiting in the other room. 15 minutes later, this is, a, <laughs> this is the next angiographic image. So, I mean, these are all things learned the hard way. And, uh, and then the first thing that we, we didn't have ECMO, so the first thing we could do was to advance an Impel. And remember, this is 2012. Impel had just been approved like one year uh, prior to this. And, and there was no Impel CP, so this is Impel 2.5. Uh, we placed the pacemaker, we, we had to shock the patient a few times, so finally the patient with impella and pressors got stabilized. We, had, we still have anesthesia there, and we were doing those cases with, uh, uh, with uh, TEE. And you can see now we inject the root of the aorta, and the left corner is nowhere to be found. So what shall we do? Any, any comments? So we, we had already closed the, 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 left, the left femoral axis. We, had, we, put, we placed impella through right coronary axis. We didn't know about same, uh, uh, using the same impella sheet for, for axis, so we got access in the, in the, radial, uh, in the right radial. And we advanced uh, a few catheters, so, you know, and we were able to, uh, to get a confianza wire in between the leaflets and the, and the um, and the stent of the valve into something. And, uh, and this is after trying. This is not like one picture follows the other. There was a significant amount of time and trying and going back and forth with different guiding catheters until we were able to get that AL1 catheter pointing towards the left coronary cusp and advance uh, that uh, wire. So then we did sequential balloon inflations uh, and uh, finally, we got this. Uh, <coughs> we got this result. Uh, we felt that, well, you know, supporting the patient. She's 91 years old, so, so she's not a surgical candidate at this point. Uh, we IVS that. We 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 felt that we had enough. Uh, we had enough space. We could not deliver a stent, so we felt that uh, uh, this uh, this result was uh, kind of acceptable. And uh, obviously, the flow is slow because the patient is in, is in shock. So the, so the, mechanism, um, the mechanism of occlusion here was basically that the, the leaflet got pinned in, in front of the left coronary. Correct. Which is why, obviously, you had no access and it was Cor difficult and you did stiff wires to get there. Correct. So ballooning it is not really solving the problem, right? It's not really resolving the problem. I mean, we felt that maybe the ballooning is just pushing the the stent away, but you still have the, the leaflet there, so you have to put a uh, stent. But the, again, this is 2012. So uh, many things have learned, uh, have been learned since then. So, 
So this is, uh, this is actually one of the first papers on coronary occlusions. This is 2013. Actually, I, am, uh, I think I'm the fourth author on that, uh, on that paper. We, we provided cases, including the case that you just saw, uh, to this registry. They had uh, 44. This was kind of a case control study. Um, they had uh, almost uh, 6,700 patients and they had 44 cases, so it's a very, it's a very rare occurrence. But you can see that uh, we started to understand this phenomenon and it was a lot more frequent in patients who already had a valve in valve. And this was followed by uh, Danny, uh, Danny DeVere uh, Vivid uh, Registry. And then we understood that then that there are certain valves that are associated with um, increased uh, rates of um, coronary occlusion. And these are the, the valves that uh, have, um, that are stentless or the ones that are stented, but then they have externally uh, mounted uh, leaflets. And those are really, really um, dangerous. And, and then still, you know, that represents a problem because uh, many of these patients will come back with degenerated valves that need the solution and they're not surgical candidates. We also understood that you cannot do, uh, you cannot do TAVR without a CT and understood also that the distance between uh, the virtual valve to the coronary origin, that's a VTC distance, has to be more than four millimeters so you can safely perform a TAVR and understood also that the cusp height and the, and the the size of the sinuses of Valsalva and the height of the sinotubular uh, junction are important. So people, smart people, including uh, Rob Letterman and Adam Greenbaum and, uh, and the likes came up with this uh, after, you know, conceiving that uh, the, the lampoon procedure to prevent, uh, to prevent uh, outflow, um, outflow tract um, obstruction after mitral valve in valve or after mitral uh, uh, after mitral uh, TMVR, so they came up with a with the laceration of the of the leaflet in the basilica procedure. They just published uh, that registry uh, that shows that it's associated with uh, an increased risk of stroke. Um, it is successful in up to 95% um, of the cases. It needs a, a certain degree of skill, and what it does, it opens up uh, the cusp so the leaflet doesn't occlude the coronary. I mean, there are a lot of nuances to that. So I think that um, coronary obstruction is, uh, is, is a very, uh, it's a very bad complication with a mortality of up to 50%. Um, the cusp height is important, uh, especially when it's more than the, it's higher than the coronary height, the sinus width and the calcium volume are factors that are implicated. It's more frequent in valve in valve cases, especially with certain type of valves. You have to be very careful the way you assess with um, your, your, your CT scan and uh, understand what the VTC is. Um, now we're gonna be seeing more uh, TAVR in TAVR cases where you have a risk of sinus sequestration. You can protect the, you can, you can snorkel a stent in some cases and protect, you just place an undeployed stent in the coronary when you think that there's a risk and you can always pull back the stent and snorkel a, snorkel a stent. And then there's another situation where you can have delayed coronary obstruction post tower which is very difficult to treat. I've seen one patient of a tower done in a different place and um, the patient ended up going back to that place, had, um, had uh, a retrograde uh, approach, and then the patient ended up dying when they were trying to uh, open the ostium of that coronary. So this is it. Thank you so much for the attention. I hope that the case was illustrative of the gravity of the situation. Thank you. That was a great case, Mauricio. Thanks for presenting it. I guess one of the, the questions is in addition to uh, the valve to coronary distance is also the, the coronary height from the nadir of Correct. the valve. And that coronary looked super low and whether or not basilica would have even prevented that would be of a, of a question. Have you had experience with basilica yeah. and? Yeah, I completely agree. And you know, what, what did we know at the, in those days? I think that we were making our experience and we were just uh, getting our gears going uh, with Taver. And, and, and until it was recognized that uh, valve in valve is, is a real risk. Let me ask you something else. So obviously these days, um, what we have learned from this experience is to, is to have a stent, of, you know, with a guideliner in the coronary in case 
and you need it, you obviously have it available, you don't have to find it. But then the technique, I guess, is to have the snorkel stand, right, which basically extends outside Correct. from the left main, um, bridging that, that segment where the valve is basically occluding the vessel. Correct. What, so in, in my mind, that does not sound to be an ideal solution kind of for, long term, for a long-term situation, right? That stent can be, can be squashed. I mean, stents are not made to basically hang in the aorta between a valve and, and the aortic wall. Yeah, well, that, that's a rationale for people coming up with a basilica procedure, which is not an easy procedure to do. And, and some specialized centers uh, should, that, are, have, that have the experience with that procedure uh, are the ones that should be doing it. Yeah, and knowing where your post is is pretty critical because yes. a lot of times what you'll find is that the valve was oriented inappropriately for basilica to be helpful. You know, if the, if the post is right across from the left main, you know, you can do basilica until the cows come home, but it, it just isn't going to help you with that. Getting the stents out is also another issue. So, uh, you know, one of the things is every time we put them in, we plan on leaving them somewhere because they, it's easy to strip the stents and or have them, uh, you know, be dis, uh, deformed in the left main, so yeah, it is correct. a challenge. If you and, and that's another coronary complication of TAVR, the inability to, re, you know, to cannulate the, the vessels again. So you have to make sure that when you are delivering the valves, you align the posts correctly to the commissures, and there's a way with a core valve with the, um, with the ports looking away from you. And I'm not sure that there's a way exactly with the, with the Edwards valve, but that's less common because the Edwards valve is, is, is shorter, so the ability to engage uh, is, is, is less problematic with the, with, the, with the sapien valve. Do we have a question? Yeah, actually, audience? that was exactly what I was about to ask from Mauricio and the rest of the panel in terms of uh, the type of valve. You know, I know there are strong feelings about you know, core valve versus uh, sapien in some centers, but as we go and do more low-risk patients with TAVR and we may need to get access to that coronary for future purpose. What's your experience on, um, does it matter for you? Because, you know, my own experience with the core valve is harder to get him back to the coronary. So uh, what do you think and what do you do? I mean, the, the one thing is aligning the posts, right? So that's been described by the, the group in Mount Sinai. Um, so we don't do valve in valves. I mean, going back to the valve in valve case, nowadays, if I, if, if I had to choose a valve to do a valve in valve, I would choose a core valve. Mostly because uh, the, the, the previous prosthesis are small and because of the superannular position of the leaflets. So that's one. So the other one is that you have to, when you, de when you deliver that valve, you have to align the posts and you have to put the ports away, looking away from you. So, you, you know, that's, that's the, the recommendation. And it is what it is, and uh, you have to you have to be you have to be careful. And then when you go in and you, you're trying <coughs> to cut these patients, you have to take a, a root, you know, like a, a manual root shot, so you understand the position of the corners, and sometimes lead with uh, with uh, with the J wire across one of the the, di uh, the you know the, the diamonds the, the diamonds of the of the core valve to be able, but you may never be able to cannulate selectively that vessel, and you may have to use a guideliner, you may have to herb mail uh, the coronary wire if that's what you need to do. And I would say if you have to have an application for accessing the coronaries through your valve, that's a sign that it's probably more difficult. So I do think, you know, my experience through Evolutes is painful. Um, so it, it's just difficult to access coronaries working through struts uh, compared to the Edwards valve that's got a lower profile. So okay. super case. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Farshad Fruzende. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. I was uh, surprised. <laughs> Thanks to Manus and the organizers uh, for inviting me. Sorry, my voice is not quite back from last night having too much fun. And it's really hard to pursue the two great talks we had from Manus and Mauricio uh, on a topic that's very important because a stroke in cat lab, you know, it happens. You know, if you do enough cases, you see. And uh, a very important thing, as Manus mentioned, is to have an algorithm to deal with these kind of complications, uh, how rare they can be. Although if you look at the registers, it is not as rare. I mean, 0.5% 
um, or less, uh, depending again how the complexity of cases you do, the patient may end up having a clinically significant stroke. And these are mostly actually ischemic strokes, but they can be some hemorrhagic strokes too. And the risk factors for these uh, basically um, strokes are things that are very familiar to us taking care of patients with advanced cardiovascular disease. Um, adding, you know, the use of pump, and again, treating more complex patients nowadays, you know, more advanced age uh, uh, patients that come to the cath lab with all sorts of risk factors. Uh, we really need to have an awareness between us as physicians, uh, the cath lab team, the stroke team, and really coordinate it correctly to address this issue when it happens. It can be overwhelming, so uh, the best is to just be ready for it. And it is not only associated with morbidity and cost, but also it increased the mortality of these patients up to 10 times. So it is not something really just uh, about mortality. Um, and if you want to use you know, TPA, just be careful. There's a lot of risk uh, calculations you have to do. And then there's a whole uh, list of you know, uh, eligibility that you have to go through. So there's a lot of patients that are unfortunately excluded uh, to be eligible to receive TPA and the timing of the last well-known of the patient is critical, uh, less than 4.5 hours. So if it happens right in the cath lab, that's one thing, but if it's post that, uh, you have to know the exact time. Although most of the patients, when it happens in the cath lab right after PCI or during PCI, because of actually heparin and high ACT, the patient is not gonna be eligible. So I'll just walk you through some cases and then uh, go over our own uh, algorithm, how uh, we do with, uh, deal with these cases. So we have a 71-year-old male, you know, uh, comes in, he had a mid-RCA PCI, came back for a stage PCI on the diagonal branch, uh, had some issues last time, uh, so he was given a fair amount of sedation. Uh, the operator, you know, was very careful with ACT, do amputated therapy, did a nice job, got a good result in the PCI, uh, but then at the end of the procedure, the patient had some difficulty in talking. I'll get back to these cases, let you know what happened. So case two, we have an 88-year-old male uh, comes in with some past medical history and uh, chest pain while actually golfing, pretty active for his age, was found to have anterolateral uh, ST elevation MI. So he was taken to the cath lab. As you see, the LAD is you know, occluded. You see the operator has kind of difficulty engaging. So these are the cases, you know, you do more catheter manipulation, so you should be even uh, extra careful. And then the RCA is a CTO. So the patient underwent a successful uh, PCI, good result, was about to be discharged next day, and then this happens. Uh, he was uh, basically had difficulty talking, ended up having a left MCA ischemic stroke. So case number three, a 54-year-old gentleman basically comes in with non-ST elevation MI, and this was his left coronary system, which was okay, and the right, you know, was a occlusion distally. Uh, he underwent a PCI, good result, drug eluting stent, and, uh, but at the end of the procedure, he was found to have a slurry speech, difficulty answering questions appropriately. So uh, the first thought was that it could be because of sedation, so he was reversed, things didn't get better, and at the same time that he was being reversed, a stroke team was activated. So one thing you wanna do is to go through this differential really quickly, not to spend too many uh, minutes on this because it's really important to get the diagnosis, get the patient going here, but check for hypoglycemia, seizure, all uh, sorts of things, especially the over sedation. Um, this is the algorithm we have in our center at UH uh, in Cleveland, and this is for patients in IR suite or in cath lab when they have a neurological deficit. Again, you go through your differential diagnosis really quick, you activate the a stroke team, some places they call it brain attack team, so bad team. Uh, you check the ACT really quick. Again, it's a very important decision-making point in your uh, tree of uh, uh, decision-making tree. And then you have to do an NIH, uh, so, uh, basically a stroke scale to assess the extent uh, of the problem. So this is the scoring system. Of course, it's not easy for us not being familiar with it, so hopefully by then the neurology uh, team and the stroke team is there to do it for you. Uh, and if you have a fairly large occlusion that you are suspecting, you have two options. Either you have the ab ability to go to the IR suite uh, or somebody from IR comes and do a cerebral angiogram. This is recommended to, again, not wasting time even for CT scan. Go ahead and do it right then. But if you don't have that uh, availability, then you pursue with a CTA scan, uh, including CTA uh, head and neck to make sure there's no more other source of uh, major embolism. And if you have a large occlusion documented, and again, you don't have the ability to do endovascular treatment in your center, then you transfer the patient where they can do it. 
Uh, but of course, you go through the algorithm if the patient is eligible for TPA, but most of our patients in the cath lab because of ACT um, should be less than 180. They won't be actually eligible to receive this. Very important thing, please do not remove the arterial access site sheet. It is not just because IR might be able to go through that and do their procedure. It is mostly for access site issues, especially if you end up giving the patient TPA. So until you have the decision made what to do with this patient, you should not remove the sheet. And again, um, these are the um, basically um, lists that you have to go through through the TPA uh, decision pathway. Uh, but again, most of these patients, um, uh, instead of going to get TPA, they are going to be endovascular if they are eligible. Uh, candidates, but there are some patients that are not going to do well either way. So if the patient is very advanced age, they have disability on baseline, they have high INR, major comorbidities, but again, um, in right patient uh, group, it can be a life-saving situation and get the patient out of the problem with a stroke. And uh, there's also a scoring system based on CT scan the radiologists use to figure out what's the extent of the possible uh, infarct. So in our case one, remember this was a patient that uh, got a diagonal branch PCI, at the end of the procedure had this arteria. So the um, stroke team was called in, uh, by the time they assessed the patient, it was all about 30 minutes of, um, from the actual presentation, and the patient completely actually um, improved, the neurological deficit actually improved uh, fully. The MRI showed a small, basically a stroke, so no TPA was given, no need for endovascular treatment, just medical treatment, patient did uh, fabulous. So 88-year-old guy with a STEMI, so this was a patient that the neurologist assessed the patient, this was, remember, one day after the PCI, so the sheet was already out, you know, the patient, you know, we didn't have issue with ACT, so the neurologist, you know, assessed the patient, found to be a good candidate, despite the age, being active, they gave the patient TPA, uh, was in hospital for a few days, uh, resolved the symptoms, uh, went to a skilled nursing facility for rehabilitation, overall did uh, fairly well. And our 54-year-old guy with non um, this was a uh, patient that was reversed in the cath lab at the same time, again, a stroke team was called in, and they assessed the patient, uh, the, uh, underwent CT scan, uh, and um, the, which were negative for bleeding, and again, because it was happening right after the PCI patient was not a candidate for TPA, so ended up uh, and had a high, basically, NIH uh, stroke scale, so ended up going to the IR, and this is what they did. So you have a flush occlusion of this left dominant M2 branch, and he underwent, uh, basically, aspiration with Plamra, great result, and it was only a seven-minute procedure to get the whole thing done. So he did well eventually and uh, neurologically fully recovered. So in summary, a stroke in cath lab happens, you know, uh, we cannot deny that. The more you do, the more at risk you are going to be, the more extensive things that we are doing in the cath lab, you are going to have more of this. It associates with mortality, it's not just morbidity, look for the risk factors as much as you can um, uh, employ the uh, prevention strategies. Look for differential diagnosis, but please do not, as Manus mentioned, do not be in this denial stage for too long because the, every minute you lose is going to be worsening the patient outcome no matter what you do. Uh, and again, get to your, your team together, and there are different options to deal with these patients, medical, TPA versus IR. And thank you so much for your attention. Arshad, thanks for that. Any uh, thoughts from our panel? I actually uh, want to point out the algorithm we have uh, in, in Ford, uh, and I have witnessed the case of this. We actually try to bypass uh, like more fast, we have a direct con communication with the uh, neurointerventionalists. So if we suspect a patient on the table, we call them right away while the neurology team is arriving. So the case that I had is the patient was suspected right away, noticed. Neurointerventionalists were in the lab within 15 minutes. We shot an angiogram, we retrieved a clot within 30 minutes. So sometimes not going to CT, not waiting for even neurology team, because most likely it's going to be embolic, most likely, so. Yeah, I guess that also gets to the question of the utility of TPA for these, you know, Alan and I were just talking, you know, TAVR, you would, you know, we think we're knocking off debris rather than thrombus, so, you know, we really try to avoid TPA, you know, in an algorithm and really move towards neurointervention, as you outlined. Yeah, that. TPA is more for patients that like the one we had, like one day after, you know, but most of, as you said, PCI procedure patient because of ACT, they wouldn't be able even to get it, so. 
So for the neurointerventional team, in terms of the sequence, um, they all get the CT of the head first, right, to rule out a bleed, and if it's negative, then they move to the next so step. In, so in our system, we have the main hospital, main academic place, and then they, we have like seven, six other hospitals, they have cat labs, um, but, and they don't have IR, like the stat, all the time, 24 seven. So it depends where the situation happens. If it happens in the academic center, the IR can come and do the angiogram right away. Like Michael mentioned, they come and do it before even going for the CT scan. This has been advocated to you know, decrease the amount of stroke burden. But in most places, you're right. They go for CT first, make sure there's no bleed, uh, and then um, be transferred uh, to get the patient done in the but, but just to be clear, so if you have the team available, let's say you can do it in your cath lab, mm -hmm. then the preferred route is to do the angiogram and, exactly. and you do not need the CT. No, you're not no. worried about a bleed. Correct, correct. Question here. One question I have uh, relates to uh, the patients who already have lima. Uh, post-bypass patients. Although the radial axis versus femoral axis has not shown uh, any difference in the risk of stroke, have you guys have any experience with if radial axis or femoral axis is superior with respect to stroke in these patients? I mean, thankfully, our, our experience with the stroke is not that much to actually really, these are like the few cases I could find over the couple of years in our system to show case here. So we, I couldn't find anything like uh, graph related. But as a default, most of our operators, they go actually femoral to do the um, bypass grafts. Um, and again, manipulation in the arch. I mean, we are all radial first, right, hopefully by now. Uh, but the manipulation, especially older patients, we should be very careful. That's one thing I tell our fellows, make sure you flush the sheets, you know, you do a nice, you know, catheter exchange. Don't manipulate too long with the same catheter. Um, you know, give yourself uh, time to flush and do it again. So, and I don't have experience with Lima stroke situation. Yeah, I mean, I think if looking at the, the different studies, I do think the stroke rate is higher radially than it is femorally, if you look at it. I'm surprised, you know, in our institution, our stroke rate is higher with PCI than it is with TAVR, um, whether that's, you know, use of cerebral protection. But I, I do think that this is something that is an issue. And unfortunately, they rarely, uh, you know, the frustrating thing is they rarely present, you know, immediately in the procedure. They usually are in that window like at four hours when they aren't candidates for TPA, we attribute a lot of this to sedation and exactly. stress and X and kind of waste time. You know, again, d your denial slide was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> we, we come up with every reason exactly. why they're just slower. But, uh, yes, I, I don't want to have a stroke in my NCDR yeah. report, but I, I, no, please do the reversal, call the stroke team, let them get together. Yeah, that's a yeah. smart plan. Yeah. Any other thoughts we got? I just had one la one final question. Technically, I wonder, uh, and I haven't done this myself, but I haven't asked our neurologist, but if we did partial protamine reversal to get the ACT under 180, have some of those patients ever fallen into a TPA-eligible state? No, we haven't done that, especially right after a PCI in this situation. We have never done that. So I, don't, I didn't know that could be an uh, option to reverse the ACT. But. And I think for small smaller strokes, which may be harder to retrieve endovascularly, it'd still be nice to Might be, an option. Be, up, uh, be able to offer someone. I think one, one comment as well. So some labs do have actually a portable CT that can come to the cath lab. So I've seen it where, you know, there's a cerebral event, clear event, they bring the, the portable scanner in the lab, so you know if it's a bleed or not. So if it's not, then you can proceed, as you're saying, with thrombectomy or whatever. But if it's a bleed, actually I've been in cases where there's a massive intracranial bleed in hypertensive patients, then that's a different story. But again, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much. Our last uh, speaker in this session is my co-moderator, Alan Jeremias, who's going to talk about uh, coronary physiology for complication prevention. Thank you so much. Pleasure uh, being here today. And I just want to point out that uh, this is the only uh, topic in this whole session where we're talking about uh, a technology preventing complication, not causing some, right? And so the most straightforward way to think about it, of course, is by potentially avoiding an intervention that can cause complications, right? So this is a bifurcation angiographically. It appears that both the diagonal and, and the LAD branch are involved. But of course, we know that the angiogram is, is not ours, always our best friend in terms of telling us what to do. And, and when we actually look at this um, from a physiological standpoint, um, we find that the diagonal branch is non-significant. And then somewhat surprisingly also the LAD, in fact, was also non-significant by physiology, despite a reasonably good amount of plaque burden um, on, on the IVIS, um, as you can see. 
And so this is not an uncommon phenomenon, and I, I think we might be over-treating site branches based on our angiographic assessment. The question always is, okay, when is a site branch important enough that it requires um, therapy? And it really depends on how much myocardium a branch is supplying to actually cause a problem. And so generally speaking, this is an old um, nuclear test, nuclear study, um, now almost 20 years um, old, but basically it tells us that the risk of a patient for a complication really goes up when we have about 10% or so of the myocardium at risk. So there's not so many branches in a coronary uh, tree that actually supply 10% of the myocardium. Maybe this diagonal is one example where it's you know in that range, but most of the time it is not. Um, in this case, it is exactly 10%, right? And so it's not uncommon that we find ourselves, especially when we're treating left mains, um, as in this case, that we do a pretty straightforward um, um, crossover stand from the LED into the left main, and the circumflex gets pinched, and obviously, angiographically, this jailed circumflex does not look pretty. Um, but in fact, physiologically, many, many times, if we are um, checking, it is actually okay. And in this particular case, the patient um, underwent a repeat angiogram eight months later, and as you see, it basically um, remains unchanged. And when we look at this systematically, what we find that the vast majority of these jail circumflexes, despite the angiographic appearance of there maybe being a stenosis, actually is not significant. And I think if you can avoid potentially putting a second stent um, and you know, doing um, more extensive intervention in, in, in the left main or in any bifurcation, I would say, generally speaking, from what we know from the European Bifurcation Club, the outcomes are better um, with a single stent strategy than with a two-stent strategy. So I think this is a very, very easy and, and straightforward way of using physiology to potentially avoid a more complex PCI that may lead to more complications and worse outcomes um, down the road. So we spoke about the angiogram being the gold standard, um, maybe not so much anymore now with the advent of imaging and, and physiology. Many times, unfortunately, um, our visual estimation of, of lesion severity, for whatever reason, does not work. Um, this is I, my, my, one of my favorite slides actually coming from um, Bill Fearon's um, fame study. Um, which indicates this kind of functional angiographic mismatch where we believe we might see actually a significant stenosis, but again, physiologically speaking, many times that's not the case unless you have a very, very severe stenosis um, of more than um, 90%. And of course, um, um, when we talk about complications, I think lawsuits are, are part of the deal, right? And, and in this particular one, um, it was actually mentioned in the lawsuit that this particular doctor failed to do physiologic assessment before PCI in many cases, um, and, and that led um, to, to the lawsuit for um, unjustified uh, PCI. The other issue, of course, is that even when we do physiology, sometimes it's not so easy to figure out what should we treat. So in this case, you know, it's not difficult to imagine that this uh, physiologic assessment of this LED is abnormal, but you know, where would you put the stand? And so we have a pretty easy way now of figuring that out by just doing a pullback. Um, you can do this under resting conditions with IFR, for example. There's now also a technique described with FFR to distinguish focal lesions from diffuse disease, but it really helps us identify um, where those lesions are that benefit the most um, from, uh, from PCI. And of course, when we're looking at this more distal vessel, it's all diffuse disease. You know, maybe that's not necessarily the biggest bang for your buck if you pave it with stents, but this um, nice jump more proximally can be treated um, easily with a focal stent um, and usually yields very, very good results. And when we're looking at this LED I showed you before, somewhat surprisingly, lesion number three, which angiographically I think appears um, the most significant, really only has four IFR units of pressure loss, meaning a very mild physiologic stenosis. Lesion number two is more significant with a 12 unit loss, and most surprisingly, the osteal LAD, which angiographically does not appear bad at all, has a 15 unit um, pressure loss. And so I think based on the angiogram, many of us would treat lesion number two and three when actually the biggest benefit from a physiologic standpoint um, would be to treat lesion number one and two and leave, um, leave three alone. And now we can also co-register that onto the angiogram. Um, this is a technology called SyncVision. 
um, well, we do this pullback and then we co-register to the angiogram and we can see exactly um, is this a focal lesion, is it diffuse disease, where should we put the stents, um, and also we can kind of plan the procedure. We have the stent planner, this white line, where we can actually calculate ahead of time what is going to be the physiologic benefit um, of the PCI um, in this case. So this is a case of a, a friend of mine in Germany, um, a patient who came, uh, who had a stent of the proximal RCA in the past, now comes in with ACS, has a mid-RCA stenosis. Um, I would say the majority of, of folks would just go ahead and treat this mid-RCA. Um, mid he was actually somewhat diligent and did a physiology assessment, um, which was abnormal in the distal vessel. But then he does the pullback, and it turns out that there is very little uh, pressure loss again in that mid-RCA, and the majority of the pressure loss is actually within the stent in the proximal lesion, as you see by all those dots displayed um, in that lesion. And in high mag, as you can see, there's actually a very aggressive instant restenosis in that area that was completely overlooked um, on the original angiogram. And so I would submit to you that would be a pretty significant complication treating this mid-RCA and, and leaving the actual ischemic lesion um, behind. And so, um, not to our surprise, we know this now for at least 20 plus years, study after study after study, when we actually look at PCI patients versus um, those um, um, undergoing uh, medical therapy or, or various stents, that even with PCI, when we think we do a good job, about 20 to 30 percent of patients still complain of angina um, one year after the procedure. And so we looked at that kind of systematically and defined PCI where we assessed um, the, the um, um, residual disease, if you will, after an angiographically successful procedure. And so what we asked um, the, the physicians to do in this trial is to do your best with, with your PCI. When you think you're done, normally you would end the procedure. We asked them to do a blinded IFR and an IFR pullback so we can understand what is the ischemic burden left behind um, after we think we did a good job. And it turns out that in 24% of cases, basically one out of four patients, we still have significant ischemia despite us thinking we, we did well. Um, and this is one of those cases where we see this, this severe stenosis um, in this mid to distal LAD, which was treated successfully with, with one stent. And then this is the blinded physiology assessment afterwards. The initial IFR was 0.39, very abnormal. It went to 0.74, obviously significant improvement. But 0.74, I don't think really is a great result, especially not when we look at this pullback and we see that there is one focal area where there is a 33 um, unit of IFR pressure loss, which easily could be stented. Um, and the patient could have had a perfect result if this was known. So I think this is actually the, the biggest complication that we can prevent when we use physiology is to actually treat what we need to treat um, and, and not leave lesions behind that can be treated easily. So how should we do PCI um, in the current era? I think Syntax 2 is one of those trials where um, it kind of leads the way. They treated very, very complex disease, including a lot of CTOs, multivessel disease, and what they did was a systematic physiologic assessment in almost all patients. 84% of patients were imaging guided. And when we um, look at the outcomes, what we find is that many patients can be downgraded with respect to their lesion severity. So they actually undergo fewer stents, fewer vessels have angioplasty. Um, but in the end of the day, when compared to the original syntax cohort, there was a significant improvement um, in clinical outcomes at one year, and now there's actually a multi-year um, follow-up. As you see, there's a pretty dramatic difference between the two curves. And in fact, when, when we now comp overlay that to the cabbage arm from the original syntax group, we find that contemporary PCI, if performed adequately, matches up with bypass surgery for these really um, complex patients, and the result is durable um, up to five years, um, uh, which has been just presented, um, the five-year results. And again, compared to bypass surgery, um, no significant difference. So remember, looks can be deceiving, especially when you're looking at the angiogram. So I think these days we've got to do more to really understand what we're dealing with and try to achieve the best result. Thank you so much. Super. Sheila? Yeah, just a very sophisticated uh, presentation, Alan, always from you, is always informative. But I really think that, you know, that mid-RCA that most people would have stented that had the osteal stent um, hanging that you went ahead and did physiology on. It's very important to know that if you are practicing alone, you can get 
bullied into people saying, just stent it, what are you doing? And I'm one of the youngest, I am the youngest operator in my lab, I am the only woman, I'm the only one that uses sync vision, and people think I'm crazy if I, I FFR that, but I did, and cases like that. And I think these are the cases that you have to see, these are the cases you have to bring back, and eventually um, your technicians will really see that you are you know, using the physiology correctly. And anytime there's another stent in the vessel, I think we have to look further, whether it's imaging or physio. I think that's a, that's a great point, and uh, honestly, my feeling is if, if you have sync vision available and you're not using it, you're crazy. And I'm not, I'm not saying actually in this case not to treat the mid-right. You might treat the mid-right. The point of the case was that you shouldn't only treat the mid-right. You would have missed the proximal um, stenosis. That was really the point of the case. Um, Dr. Jeremiah, congratulations. It's a very informative talk. Um, you know, the question that often comes up in the lab is when you see a stenosis that looks tight, you do an IFR, which is normal, um, but you have the urge to not stop and do something more. Um, so the question is, in your practice, do you ever then reach out for FFR or do you take out an imaging catheter? Um, and you know, wh what would you sort of tell the rest of us um, to, to practice? Yeah, all, all the time. Um, I, I don't think that you should limit yourself to, to one modality necessarily, right? There is no law, as far as I can tell, at least not in this country, that if you use t physiology, you can't be using imaging also, or if you use IFR, that you can't give adenosine. So I think all these modalities actually help to identify what's going on with the patient. It gives you potentially more clarity. You have more understanding of the case, and I think you're, you're in, a, in a better position to, to make decisions. So absolutely use um, all the modalities that you think are important, and especially, so my practice, for example, in the left main is to always use imaging and physiology. I'm not picking one or the other. Like, why would I, right? Great question here in the audience. Hi, uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. Just one thing I have in experience is that sometimes calcium can be an enemy, and the contrast, the weight stains, the calcium is sometimes, it can interfere with your eyes, and you could potentially miss the lesion to the point that you may not do IBUS or IFR. So I was thinking maybe at some point we can have a different colored contrast to visualize those calcium. And I'm sure everybody has been in the same situation where you know you mag up afterwards and you're like, oh, you know, it's the way the calcium sometimes can fool us and stain the le lesion where you, you may even miss a critical stenosis. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Calcium is one of the things that, that fools us for sure when we assess angiograms, especially calcified nodules, I think can be very, very tricky, um, both to identify and to treat. And frequently, um, if, if they're not flow limiting, maybe the best is to leave them alone because they don't really have a good prognosis and we don't have good treatments for them. Great. Alan, Alan great talk. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on using the sync vision, um, you know, as you showed in some of those cases, for people with serial lesions. So while it may help you identify where you might want to start, ideally you would want to reassess the functional significance of the other lesions before saying that's the only lesion you would stand. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I think that's the biggest advantage, right? To do the pullback, to, to have um, assessment of serial lesions. Even when you think there are no serial lesions based on the angiogram, sometimes you find some, which is why, it, why it's interesting to do. And it is important, as you say, um, to also assess, this, assess it after, because there is sometimes crosstalk. You can't say for sure that, well, you treated one lesion, um, which is the most critical, and now the other ones are going to behave the same way. Sometimes there is changes, and obviously you also check your work, right? You also want to make sure your stent is adequately um, deployed. So to, if you have the, the wire already on the table, obviously it makes sense to check it afterwards also. Great. Last question here. If there's a discrepancy between IFR and FFR, <laughs> what do you do? You think. <laughs> Help me think. Look, I mean, I, I also dislike very much, by the way, to use IFR, FFR, any of these modalities in, in absolute terms, right? Well, I think we have to kind of step back a little bit and understand there is an is ischemic continuum. Um, I know that we use these numbers in the trials, obviously for clinical trials, we need to, to set um, boundaries and, and those have been now adopted into the guidelines. But it doesn't mean that somebody with an FFR of 0.81, you should, you should you know, never stand. 
And it doesn't mean that somebody with an FFR of 0.78, you have to always stand. And so um, I really think it depends on the clinical scenario. And so when you have a discrepancy between a resting index and, and uh, an FFR, again, it depends on the clinical scenario. If somebody's really symptomatic, then obviously you're gonna treat them. If they have no symptoms, then you, you don't. So it depends on, on other factors as well. Would you proceed to image or just go with Angie at that point? If, yeah, look, if, if, if I have a, a high clinical suspicion that the patient's really symptomatic um, and I'm concerned about it, I think it potentially could help you. Imaging in general, I think, is very, very helpful when you plan for PCI and to guide your PCI. It is a little bit less helpful to make the decision whether or not you should be doing PCI. Thank you. Well, thanks, everyone, for a terrific session. Thanks to the panelists for the great discussion. And uh, we're up for a break now and see everyone back at 1030.